we know that uh, the kinetic energy that an object has is the energy of the object due to its motion. But that motion could be one of a couple things. It could be translational motion. It could be translational motion. Or it could be rotational motion. And we have an idea now of what rotational motion is. Uh, the rotation about some axis of rotation. Whereas translational motion is going from point A to point B, generally we think of some kind of linear motion moving left and right, up or down. And now that an object could move translationally or rotationally, then it could have two different forms of kinetic energy. And we're going to call those two forms translational kinetic energy and rotational kinetic energy. We already know what the form of the equation for translational kinetic energy is. We know that translational kinetic energy, which we used to just write K for, but now I'm going to write K TRA, where TRA is the subscript which stands for translational. KTRA equals one half mv squared. So if I have uh, just a single particle and it is moving with a speed v and it has a mass m, it has a translational kinetic energy of one half mv squared. And now we want to go through a similar uh, you know, line of thinking to say what, what do we think the, the equation would be for the rotational kinetic energy. So K rotational, which we'll abbreviate ROT, R-O-T, K rotational equals, we should expect that the rotational kinetic energy still depends on how fast the thing's moving and what the mass of the object is, but how exactly does that uh, factor in. So let's say that we have an object that is rotating on some arm where the object is just a single particle like this and maybe that particle has a mass m and it's moving with a linear speed v at some distance which is uh, a distance r away from an axis of rotation which i'm going to label here with an x so at some point later uh, that mass would be up here as it rotates in a circle. Its velocity would slightly change direction and it would keep going around in a circle. And so it has an angular velocity, omega, which is directed like this. If the object still has a mass m and a linear speed v, I could find the rotational kinetic energy by using that same equation, or at least we could try that but then express the rotational kinetic energy in terms of the angular speed, not the linear speed. And so if an object has a linear speed v, then we know that v and omega are related to that relationship, v equals r times omega, where r is the radius. And so the rotational kinetic energy would be given by 1 half m, and then instead of v, I'm going to write r times omega squared. I'm now going to rearrange that a little bit to say the rotational kinetic energy is equal to 1 half m r squared omega squared. The reason why I'm going to, to write it like that is because there's an important quantity that we haven't learned yet, which includes this uh, m r squared term that I'm going to talk about now. Let's say that instead of on that rod I just have a mass m at the end, let's say that um, I had the same rod, there was a mass m at the end, but then there was another mass m closer to the center. And so uh, maybe we could call the distance from the axis of rotation to the first mass r1, and then we could call the distance from the axis of rotation to the second mass r2. And so for each mass, there's a different radius. And so you could imagine maybe we have a, you know, there's a rod with like 30 masses on it. And the distant, or, or uh, the, only th the only way that that term would change, the mr squared term, would be we would have a different mass and a different r value. 
but because v is always equal to r times omega, we would still get the same kind of equation. And so you, what you should imagine is if there are multiple masses on this rod as it rotates, then the total rotational kinetic energy would be given by something that looks like um, the rotational kinetic energy of the first one plus the rotational kinetic energy of the second one. Each mass would need to contribute some rotational kinetic energy. And for each one of those masses, I'm going to get a 1 half m r squared omega squared and an m, sorry, a 1 half m r squared omega squared. We know now that as those multiple masses on that same rod are rotating, they would have the same angular speed. And so for that reason, in this equation, the omegas are going to be the same, but the masses and the radii, or the, 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 the arms that they're rotating through, are not necessarily going to be the same length or have the same mass. And so I should have like an m1 r1 squared, m2 r2 squared. And so what I notice about these terms is no matter how many terms there are, no matter how many masses are rotating, the one half is in all of the terms and that's not changing. And the omega squared is in all of the terms and that's not changing. But the term in between is specific to the mass. It's whatever the mass is, so I'm gonna write mi, and whatever r is, the radius, the distance away from the axis of rotation, I'm gonna write r times i. Okay, and that r is squared. So what I've shown now, of course there's multiple ways to write this, but what I've tried to show is a way of expressing the rotational kinetic energy of an object. And now I want to take a moment to compare these two things. I have this one for rotational kinetic energy, and I have this one for translational kinetic energy. For translational kinetic energy, we have 1 half m v squared, and for rotational kinetic energy, we have 1 half times m times r squared times omega squared. And so now we're going to move to another slide and, and compare those a little bit more. So as I said, for the translational kinetic energy, we have 1 half m v squared. And for the rotational kinetic energy, we have 1 half m r squared omega squared. And I told you that for every linear or translational type of quantity, there's going to be an analogous uh, quantity for rotational motion. And so when we look at these two equations, we should be seeing some of that. We see the V here, and then we see the omega there. That is the linear and angular quantities for speed. And the only other quantity that's in my translational kinetic energy equation is mass. And so this mr squared thing must be the thing that is the analogous quantity to mass for rotating bodies. And it is. This mr squared is something that we're going to call the moment of inertia. The moment of inertia is a quantity that, like mass, describes how easy it is for something to rotate. If I have a particle that is um, just like a single particle that doesn't have any physical size or uh, characteristics that are important, then the equation for moment of inertia is just equal to mr squared. And the symbol that we use for moment of inertia is i. So i equals mr squared for something like uh, a point mass or a particle. And so what I could do is write my equation for rotational kinetic energy as 1 half i omega squared. And actually that's the way that we'll write it all the time. And so if we're dealing with point particles, then we use mr squared for the moment of inertia. But what we find now is that for different distributions of mass, we get different equations for i. And these aren't things that you need to memorize. I would say that, you know, i equals mr squared is something you would want to memorize. But all these other equations that I'm going to write are not necessarily ones you need to memorize. You need to remember this form of the equation mr squared. 
but what I'm writing now is something that you could always look up or would be given to you. So I equals, in general, some number, I'm going to write the letter B for that number, times MR squared. Okay, some number times MR squared. So for a point particle, that number, B is equal to 1. For other types of objects, it might be something else. So for example, if I have an object like uh, a rod that has a mass M and a length L, and I want to rotate it through its center of mass, which looks something like this. The rod is right here, and I'm going to rotate it through this point. So half of it is to the left, half of it to the right, and it's kind of rotating through its center. If that rod has a mass M and a length of L, then the moment of inertia for that rod as it spins around, the equation that you would need to use is I equals 1 12th ML squared. So there's a number times the mass times a quantity that is related to the length of the object. If I take that same rod of length L and I change the axis of rotation. So the axis of rotation is here, but now the object is like this. So it still has a mass m and a length l, and now it's rotating about one of its ends, then the moment of inertia equation is a little bit different. Instead of 1 12th, it's 1 3rd ml squared. And you can imagine that there's, for different cylinders and disks, hoops, spheres, there's going to be different little equations for all of these. So we'll go through a couple more. If I have a sphere, a solid sphere, so it's not hollow, it's a solid sphere, which is not the easiest thing to draw, uh, at least to draw two separate things, one's hollow, one's solid. So this is my sphere, and uh, I'm going to draw some lines over it so that way we can pretend that that's a solid sphere. If that solid sphere is rotating through its center, so the axis of rotation is somewhere through its center, um, then the moment of inertia equation for that kind of object, I, is equal to 2 fifths mR squared, where the radius of this sphere is R, and the mass of the sphere is m. If I have a hollow sphere, so now I'll draw a sphere, but I won't uh, draw a bunch of lines. Then for a hollow sphere, the moment of inertia equation is 2 thirds m r squared. So there are uh, many versions of these. At some point, I might give you a table which has all the little equations in them. But the big thing to remember is that for uh, point masses, the equation is just m r squared, and that for all the other ones, it's going to be some number b times mr squared that represents that and you might be wondering where do these come from how do i figure these out um, calculus can be used to figure out what all of those coefficients are out in front by taking an object and revolving it around a coordinate system and and, and figuring out how to add up all the little pieces that are being revolved around so maybe some math that we don't know how to use yet but the the, the place where these equations come from is not so important because at the end of the day, we'll know what type of object we're dealing with, and this is something that we'll be able to look up uh, in order to use in our equations. Also, um, another important thing to consider, if I'm looking back up at my equations for translational and rotational kinetic energy, for Translational kinetic energy, if I have more than one object moving, like for example, um, you know, if I'm driving down the street in my car and then there's a bag in my car and there's some other stuff in my car, if I wanted to know the kinetic energy of all that stuff, I use the speed that we're traveling at. But then for M, I need to use the total mass. And so for rotational kinetic energy, now I'm in the, the top right corner, for that moment of inertia uh, symbol, I might need to add up multiple moment of inertia values in order to get the total. So for example, as I was referring to earlier, if I have a rod rotating and I want to know the rotational kinetic energy, if I have an object here with mass m, an object here with mass 2m, and they're different distances away from the axis of rotation, 
then when I'm finding the rotational kinetic energy of that type of system, I would need to figure out the rotational kinetic energy of the two masses independently, maybe the rod, and then add them all up together, or somehow find another way of, of adding up all of those things and making sure that I'm not leaving out uh, any of the, the objects that are rotating. So I guess lastly, in summary, um, you know, going back to the top, we have one half mv squared for translational kinetic energy, one half i omega squared for rotational kinetic energy. We have different equations which are expressed by b times m times r squared uh, for those moment of inertia values. And then I would also like to say that we need to make sure that we know that the moment of inertia could depend on two things, right? Not just the quantities in the equation, but the axis of rotation if you look at what I did with the rod, it was the same object, but the axis of rotation was in two different places, the end or in the middle, and that determines what the moment of inertia will be. So the mass distribution, which is given by the type of object and where the axis of rotation is, those two things separately could determine what the moment of inertia will be.